to your church years ago. Amen. So we'll let them. Would you welcome Pastor John Ramsey? <laughs> Amen. And I'll let you. Uh, now, your wife and daughter wasn't here in the first service, so you can introduce them too. But man, it's a good word this morning. I took notes. I'll take notes again tonight. If you don't have a journal, please get you a journal before you leave here so you can start taking notes and write down. Matter of fact, if I was in school, I'd have one of these around us so folk could see that I, where I go to church, amen, college or somewhere like that. That's a cool thing to have. All right, Pastor, you ready? You got a little more time. Well, you ready? You might be a little early, ain't you? Get out. Come on. Help yourself. All right, brother. Everybody say, help yourself. Help yourself. All right. All right. Give your pastor a big hand, everybody. I love the Lord. I'm so thankful to be here. Had a great time this morning. Had a great time over at New Caney, and we're glad, glad to be here. I do want to, I, I, you know, people come up and say, you need to introduce your, your wife and daughter. And I said, well, we introduced them this morning, but that was at the other location. So it's my beautiful wife, Brandy, and my youngest daughter, Olivia. Stand up just a minute. Give them a big hand, everybody. <clears throat> Now, she's the youngest of four. We have four girls. We have two that are grown and, grown and gone. Bless my heart. Yeah, and, I, and we've got a daughter in law school in Birmingham, and then we've got Baby Bird here, and uh, she's, she's the last. And when she's gone, we're empty nesting, and, uh, and uh, I don't know what that's going to be like. I've never, never known that in my life, so I don't, know, I don't know what that'll be like. And then we've got some guests here also. Now, these folks used to go to Harvest for years and years when they lived in Panama City, but they've moved here to Texas. And did you say it's Lee? Lee City, which is about 37 miles from here. This is Dane and Pauline Thomas. Give them a big hand, everybody. Let, let me tell you how close they are to our family. When, when our middle daughter got married this past October, they drove all the way from Texas to be there at the wedding. So they're like, they're like family to us. And, and, you know, I'm just, you know, it's hard to keep up with everybody because we, we're an Air Force town. So we have people come to Panama City, come to our church for a while, then move all over the country. And so we're used to families relocating, and it's hard for me to keep up with where everybody is at because they said, we'd have been here this morning had you told us and I just I just didn't tell them till this afternoon I saw a post on Facebook and I said hey they live right by here I need to tell them where I am and of course you people are so wonderful and welcoming they feel welcome and I appreciate that this is this church feels like harvest it does a whole lot my church is called Harvest Worship Center in Panama City I've been there 31 years and this church feels a lot like home and I think that's why it's so comfortable for me to preach here you know I saw the little uh, all the acronyms of all the little groups i can't name them off because there's a lot of them but the motorcycle people does this and whatever you know and all i don't know them all but but all these little groups are important that's all the little tributaries that make the big river on sunday morning amen i, I always preach to my people that ministry goes ministry happens monday through friday and and then on sunday we celebrate the ministry that we've done all week so all these all these little groups it's important that you get connected any high school teacher will tell you that the kids that are in the band and on the football team always make better grades because they're invested in the school. It works the same way with the church. The more you get involved, the more invested you are in the body. The more you know brother so-and-so and sister so-and-so, the more you know the burden they carry, the more you become a part of them. Carrying that burden, what's the Bible say? Pray one for another. The more connected you are, and the more connected you are, the stronger the church is because the church is about relationship. Amen? I, I mean, I've had some spectacular music in my church. I've had, I've had, I've got uh, the young man used to go to my church is now Jensen Franklin's the leader, leaders worship leader. I mean, I've had dynamic music in my church. I've had all the biggest preachers, Lester Summerall, Jesse Duplantis, Jimmy Swagger. They've all been to our church, but that's not what builds churches. Relationship is what builds churches. Amen. You might draw people with with music and preaching, but you won't keep people with music and preaching. You got to keep them because of you, the congregation connecting to them and joining to them. It's like a story I heard where a fellow walked up on a job site. They were building this big building and a fellow walked up on a job site. He, the first person they come to, he said, what are you doing? He said, well, what does it look like I'm doing? I'm laying brick. And he slapped another brick on there, slapped some more on it, slapped it on there and said, I'm laying brick. Can't you see that? So he said, okay, I won't bother you. He walked down to the same building, same building site, 
same building, same project, walked down to the back corner. There's another man laying bricks, and he said, what are you doing? He said, I'm building a cathedral. I'm building a cathedral. So listen, the difference is, is one of them saw the big picture, amen? One of them saw that one of them could only keep his eyes on the task at hand, but one of them, the guy in the back, saw the big picture. I'm not just laying bricks because every brick is a piece of this cathedral that I'm building. I'm building a cathedral. So you got to realize that when you're frying bologna sandwiches, that you're not just frying bologna sandwiches. You're building a cathedral. Amen. You got to realize that when you're when you're when you're getting a rope in the parking lot off for motorcycles, you're not just roping the parking lot off. You're building a cathedral. Amen. When you're setting out chairs, you're not just setting out chairs. You're building a church, man. You're building a kingdom. That's a, it's important what you do. And how many know God wants to use every one of us to build this cathedral? Give the Lord praise if you believe it. God wants to use every one of us. Amen. Amen. I have a couple of things I didn't get to tell you about this morning. I call this my contemporary Christian album right here. I got two I got two two albums with me. I got a bluegrass album for those of you that like bluegrass music and some of you do. I got to be careful with that one cuz like I say bluegrass empties churches so you can't overdo it with that. Now you got to be careful with the bluegrass. But this is my contemporary album which my children tell me is not contemporary. They said, "Dad, why do you always say that? It might have been contemporary 20 years ago." when you did this album, but it's not contemporary anymore. And then my wife backs him up by saying it never was contemporary. <laughs> but since I have the microphone, I'm going to do one off the contemporary album. Amen. Uh, and uh, so this is all on there. This, I did not write this song. I wrote every song on the Bluegrass album, but I didn't write this song. This was written by a fellow by the name of Dallas Holm. Remember, isn't he from Texas or, or, or something? It should be because his name's Dallas, isn't it? But anyway, he uh, wrote a lot of great songs, so I'm going to sing it. It's a song called Peaceful Harbor, and it's a, it's a good, good one, good one, old song, contemporary album. Praise God. Can you give me just a little bit more? There you go. Off my contemporary album. I've been sailing the seas for most of all these years. Riding a crest of waves made of tears I've been drifting on a troubled sea Traveling aimlessly Till I put my anchor down In peaceful harbor where the winds of despair were blowing on my face Till the day I felt the gentle breeze of amazing grace <clears throat> So I chartered a brand new course Let the Savior be my guiding force and I put my anchor down in peaceful harbor. Now I've lifted all my cargo on the docks of heaven's bay. And troubled sea, I'm traveling no more. My sailing life is over And my feet have felt the shore And now I'm standing on the other shore Hallelujah How many remember when you came to Jesus? Amen, amen All your troubles went away All of your burdens left you you put it in the hands of the Lord. You stopped fighting for things and you moved into peace. Hallelujah. Amen. Now I'm watching the sun set down on a peaceful sea. 
And never in all my life have I felt so free Now I'm standing on the other shore And I'm sailing out no more Since I put my anchor down in peaceful harbor since I put my anchor down in peaceful harbor. Since I put my anchor down in peaceful harbor. All right, come on. Come on, give him praise, everybody. <clears throat> Hallelujah. How many know a man in your life that sometimes you just don't know about? Amen. Uh, to, uh, not tomorrow night, Tuesday night, I'm going to be talking about the five seasons of David. Now, it's not just a service for men. It's a, it's a service for men and everybody know, that knows a man, whether you have a son or a husband or a father or you just know some, some nutty people at work that you want to know, why do they do that? Why, why, what was he thinking? How, how many of you women have ever thought to yourself, what was he thinking when he did that? Why would he do something like that? I'm going to tell you. I'm going to tell you why he does it. I'm going to tell you why he does it. And, and I'm going to tell you that especially if you have a son, especially if you have a son, you're going to see him change in your lifetime. David is one of the few people that we see him as a boy, and we see him grow into an old man. We see every stage of his life. And, man, even though he's a man after God's own heart, you see this guy fighting more than giants in his life. And I'm going to show you about some of that. I'm going to teach you about some of that. So join us Tuesday night for that. Tonight, let's go into the Word of God at John chapter 13. How many love the Word of God? Say amen. 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 I love the Word of God. John chapter 13 and verse 3. If we'll start there, John 13 and 3, it says this, Jesus knowing, amen, Jesus knowing that the Father had given all things unto his hand and that he had come from God and was going to God. I could preach all night on just that verse right there because if you know where you're going and where you come from, there's not too many things can be pulled over on you, amen. Verse 4 said he rose up from supper because he knew where he come from, knew where he was going. He rose up from supper, lay aside his garments, took a towel, and girded himself. And after that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel in which he was girded. And he came to Simon Peter, and Peter said to him, Lord, are you washing my feet? And Jesus answered and said to him, what, what I am doing you do not understand now, but you will know after this. And Peter said to him, you shall never wash my feet. You you shall never wash my feet. And Jesus answered and said, we got a problem then, because if I don't wash your feet, you have no part of me, okay? So you, you can't stop me in this. If I don't wash your feet, you, you have no part of me. And then Simon Peter said, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head, okay? You know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you something about Peter in a little while. You're going to see in a lot of people, because he had some spiritual issues that God wanted to deal with. Now, I know that most of us have have taken care of what I call the obvious. You know, we quit smoking and drinking and running around, and then we stopped and said, okay, I'm spiritual now. And God said, I don't want you to stop there. I want you to go a little deeper. Amen. I want to get to the issues that's bothering you. I want to get to the things that's wrecking your life, the things that's causing you problems. Jesus wants all of you. Can I get an amen? He wants all of you. He wants your marriage. He wants your finances. He wants your children. He wants your work. He wants you. He wants you, the things that you wrestle with, that you don't talk to anybody about, the things that scare you, the things that worry you. Jesus wants He wants you to cast all of your care on him. Amen. And I'll tell you why he wants it. Because he cares for you. Amen. And he wants to help you. So he don't want just part of your life. And he don't want the part that's, that's easy for you to clean up. He don't want the obvious. He wants all of you. He wants to renew your mind. He wants to repair your heart. He wants to restore your faith. He wants to realign you with your creator. 
so that you can walk in victory again. And it's more than just going to church. It's about maturing in Christ. Amen. Maturing in Christ. You know, the old, the old parable that he told about separating the wheat and the tare, that's about maturity. That's about maturity. In other words, the teacher's saying, as long as you're immature, I can't tell you from the world. I can't tell you from the world. The only way that you look different from the world is for you to grow up in Christ. Because if, if you try to pull weeds while, while they're immature Christians, you really can't tell which one's the, the, the Christian, which one's the jerk, which one's the world, which one's the church. But you let them grow up in God, and there's an obvious difference. Amen? There's an obvious difference. When you get mature in Christ, there's an obvious difference between you and the world. Too many Christians never really live in in the promises of God. They, they live right on the edge of it, but never really live in the promises of God. Let's turn to Romans chapter 10 and verse 1. I'm going to be just a little more wordy tonight. I got a little more time so I can do a little more. And so we're, we're going to read in Romans chapter 10 and verse 1. Everybody's finding that. It says, brethren, my heart's desire this is the Apostle Paul to the church at Rome. My heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they may be saved, for I bear them witness that they have zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. Uh, the Apostle Paul just said, I don't know if you missed that, but he just said, I'm glad that y'all are excited. I wish you know what you was doing. That's what the Apostle Paul just said to the church in Rome. I'm so glad that y'all are excited. I just only wish you knew what you were doing. Amen. Verse 3 says, For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own righteousness. Oh, what a dangerous thing. Being ignorant of God's righteousness, seeking to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted to the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for the righteous to anyone who believes. Amen. Now, listen to me. He said, he said I'm, I'm thrilled that you're excited. I only wish you had a little more knowledge about what we were trying to do. Because it's my understanding from what I'm hearing about the church in Rome is that y'all are real excited, but nobody really knows what God wants. So you've come up with your own things to try to feel religious, you know, to try to feel spiritual. Some people want to be spiritual, but they end up just being religious. Come on, somebody. People, I tell people all the time, I'm not religious. I'm spiritual. Amen. They want to be spiritual, but they wind up being religious. This is what Paul's talking about. Because if you don't know what the righteousness of God is, you'll come up with your own righteousness, and then you'll begin to tell people, I'm righteous because I'm doing this. I'm righteous because I cut my hair. And you know, I don't know how many of you come from old Pentecost or that, but we used to have a big deal about haircuts. I'm, I mean, it was, we used to have a big deal about outfits. You know, I remember when I first came into the Pentecost in the old assemblies of God when I was a young preacher, and man, the first three services, I didn't think I needed to go to the altar. I thought I needed to go to the mall. I, th I thought I was wearing the wrong things, what was wrong with me. And, and, and I had to mature a little bit to figure out, wait a minute, that's just something they made up. That's not even in the Bible. That's just some righteousness they came up with. That's, just, that's how they're measuring righteousness is, is by how they look. And this is exactly what the Apostle Paul is saying. If you're ignorant of God, God's righteousness, you'll, you'll devise your own. You'll tell everybody you got to have a certain translation, or you got to have a certain haircut, or you got to wear a certain length skirt, or you got to, there's a list of words you can't say, and there's a list of words you should say. There's a, there's a, there's, there, you should do this, you should, you got to knock on so many doors. You, you know, we've heard it all in our lifetime. You and me, I know you've been through where I've been through. We came through the same door of tradition, and they all had a set of rules that we had to keep for us to be righteous for that church. And and then sometime or another in our journey, we met Christ for ourselves. And we found out he loved us just like we are. Amen. And we found out that he didn't want to, he didn't want to control what we were wearing. He wanted to control what we was thinking. He didn't want to control what we were saying. He wanted to control what we was feeling and thinking. He wanted to fix the inside. And if you fix the inside, the outside will take care of itself. How many know I'm glad I found who God was? Amen. So, so, see, we don't know why we're saved. We don't know what God's righteousness is. And when we don't know those things, we'll create a justification for ourselves. And so we create a criteria to justify our own righteousness that's not God's righteousness. You know what we call it when we create our own righteousness and don't use God's righteousness? Self-righteousness. That's, that's where we get self-righteousness. I don't know what God wants. 
So I'm going to come up with some things that I think he might like, and then I'm going to judge everybody by what I come up with that I think God likes. Man, I remember when contemporary Christian music, which my CD is not, I, I, uh, I remember when contemporary Christian music come out, and I remember being in a church and something coming off the radio and the pastor hollering across the church, turn that off, don't play that in the house. Got, man, he just made a big scene in front of everything. And it was, it was the wrong beat, you know. And now it'd be tame. <laughs> I think it's Amy Grant or something. I don't know what was it. It was, it was, you know, it was, you know, it was bad, bad stuff because it wasn't used to what he was used to. They asked Billy Graham one time what he thought about contemporary Christian music, and he said, "For what's generation?" He said, "Because that red hymnal you sing out of that was contemporary at one time." The, the what you call old-fashioned used to be contemporary to another group of folks. So he said, so what generation's contemporary music are you talking about? Because it changes every few years, amen? But you know who is the same yesterday, today, and forever? Jesus Christ, amen? How many glad you know Jesus, amen? Come on, give him praise if you know him. How many glad you know Jesus? Many of us are here because we, you know, we feel like this is what we're supposed to do, and as we get here, and we're supposed to be here, and we're, we get to know God, our view of God begins to change. You know, if I put something under a magnifying glass, it doesn't get any bigger. It looks bigger. If I, if I, if I take a fingernail and I put it under a magnifying glass, I see all kind of all stuff going on. But the, the fingernail hasn't grown any bigger. Just my view of the fingernail has grown bigger. When we come in and we begin to magnify God, God doesn't grow. God's as big as he's ever going to be. But we begin to see the details of God that we've never seen before. We begin to see the highlights of God that we've never seen before. And all of a sudden, we begin to notice something different. See, see what, what I want people in the church to do is, is, you know, people think if they stop the obvious things, they're free. Well, you're beginning to be free. Amen? But I don't want you to stop there. When we actually, some of, some of the most bound up people in the world are sitting in the middle of God's church because they've come to a part where they, they've fixed fixed everything that people can see, but they've not allowed God to change anything on the inside. Amen. How many, I, mean, I know people that they're, they're no longer bound by drugs, but they're still bound by fear. Come on, somebody. They're no longer bound by drugs, but they're still worried. They're not, they're not alcoholics, but they still have a problem with gossip. You know, they, they're not smoking, but, they, but they, all the wrong things are going on in their life. They, they've quit some things that some people may frown on, may not frown on, but they've allowed other things to remain that God doesn't want in your life, amen, and, and so they get to the place, they get to the place, they're like the children of Israel, that they've left Egypt, listen to me very closely, you've left Egypt, but you never entered the promised land, amen, you, you left the obvious bondage, but you never came into the promise, amen, you're stuck somewhere between totally free and not, and totally bound, you're just kind of bound, you're just almost free, you're, you're what I call, you're what I call ordinary bondage, amen, or ordinary bondage is that place where I'm free from the obvious, but I fall victim to the ordinary. How many believe the devil's a smart devil? Listen, the devil's a smart devil. He's not wearing a, a pitchfork and a pointed tail, and he's not coming at you with horns and all. The devil's a smart devil. He knows he can't just tell you to abandon God, and he knows he can't just come to you and say, hey, give up on God. Don't do that. It'd be too obvious. So what he does is he attacks our weaknesses. He attacks our weaknesses and tries to get us to fail. Every time I bring on a new staff member, I always sit them down and I have this little conversation with them. And it goes the exact same way every time. Never fails. It's always the same way. I sit them down and I said, will you please tell me your three greatest strengths? And man, they spit them out like popcorn. I mean, oh, I can sing. I'm good with people. I'm a prayer warrior pastor. All that. And then I tell them immediately after that, I said, tell me your three greatest weaknesses. Oh, weaknesses. Hmm. Uh, well, hmm. I'm not sure. And, and I, I said, well, there's your problem right there. Because people don't crash because of their strengths. 
People don't crash. When you fly in that big old jumbo jet, that big old 737, I promise you they've checked the fuel. Amen? It's got fuel. That's not going to be your problem on this flight. Amen? I, I promise you the, the rudder, the steering wheel working, whatever they call it. it it's working. It's working. That's not going to be your problem. Your problem does not does it have two wings, one, two. That's that, that, we got that. That's under control. It's going to be something you weren't thinking of that goes wrong. See, see when you understand this, it's not not your strengths that crash your life. It's your weaknesses that crash your life. And I always tell them, you know, I always tell them, if you could fix your weaknesses, your whole life level would come up. Everything in your life would change. See, because if you look back on the pattern of your life, the times your life has crashed, the times things have went wrong, the times things have become difficult, it's an obvious pattern of things that goes wrong. I hired a man years ago uh, to, to be our music leader, and man, I went Went through all the things. I, I got a, I got a, a, some music from him. I called his old pastors. I interviewed a couple of people he worked with. I did a background check on everything. Everything checked out. And this, this man came to work with me. He was a dynamic musician. Man, he sang. He played. He was dynamic. He was wonderful at what he did. Uh, but something began to happen. After he was there a few months, he began to change. Something began to happen. And, and he began to miss some stuff. He began to not show up for some things. Finally, he had a big problem and missed the whole service one night. And I finally got him in front of me uh, in, in, my, in my office. And I said, I want you to tell me what's going on. I want you to tell me what's wrong with you. And he says, Pastor, I have an addiction problem. I said, I figured that's what it was. I figured that's why you missed church because you weren't able to make the service because you weren't in a condition to make the service. And you, and you knew if you came in there in that condition, we'd all see that. And I said, how come that's not on your resume that you've had an addiction problem in your past? And and he said, well, of course I hide that because you would have never had me in here. I said, well, number one, you don't know that. I said, you'd be surprised how much mercy and grace I have. I said, but now because you've hidden it, you've, you've become a hostage to it. How many know, I don't want to be nobody's hostage, amen? I, I don't want to be, no, so, so the things you hide become your jailer. Come on, somebody. The things you hide, you become hostage to. And so here this man was. Listen, when I'm finding out, is he a good musician, check? Is, is he skillful with people? Check. Does, does, he, does he add a good track record? Other churches? Check. Yes, but the problem was there's something he's fighting back there. That's the things God wants to get to. Amen? That's the thing God wants to deal with. And the devil's a smart devil. He knows that he can't just tell you to abandon God, so he attacks your weakness. Luke chapter 22 and verse 31. I'll read it to you real quick. The Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you that he may sift you as wheat. One translation says, Satan has desired to have you so he can grind you into powder. But I have prayed for you. How many is glad that Jesus is praying for you? I prayed for you that your faith fail not, and when you are converted. Now, I want you to put your finger right there on converted. Uh, oh, I bet you this rubbed Peter the wrong way. What do you mean, converted? I, I thought I was one of your disciples. Uh, you are one of my disciples, but you hadn't been converted yet. Amen? Uh, you, you haven't captured this thing. In other words, Jesus is telling him right there, you're still struggling with some things. Uh, oh, well, well, I'm one of your disciples. I know you are. You're still struggling with some things. I'm an usher. I know you are, but you're still struggling with some things. I'm a pastor. I know you are, but you're still struggling with some things. I, I've been at church for 20 years. I know you have, but you're still struggling with some things. And Jesus said, when you are converted, you'll strengthen the brethren. Amen. Not because you've never been through something, but because you have been through something and you know how to get through it. Amen. How many know what the devil has meant for your weakness? God is going to turn into your strength and you'll be able to help other people because you've been through it, you've been there, and you know how to get out of it. Amen. Give the Lord praise if you believe it. Jesus said, when you are converted, you strengthen the brethren. And he said to him, Lord, I'm ready to go with you to prison or to death. I always tell people that it scares me when people walk up to me and say, I'll never leave your church. I call that the kiss of death. Man, just keep that to yourself and keep praying, amen? <laughs> I've had a whole lot of people tell me that ain't with me no more, amen? Ah, come on. So Jesus, Peter said, I'll go with you to prison or death. You know what Jesus is saying? I wish that was our problem. 
I wish the fear of prison and death was really what's wrong with you, Peter, but that ain't what your problem is. He said, Peter, before the rooster crows, you're going to deny me three times, and I'm going to tell you why I'm going to let that happen. Because I need you to see, I need you to see what you really need in your life. What you really need. What you really need in your life is not more Gaither videos. Come on, somebody. They're good. I love them. Amen. What you need in your life is not more T-shirts saying where you go and what you believe. What you need is for God to deal with them things that only you and God knows you're dealing with. Is, are you with me tonight? Jesus said, I wish that was a problem. I wish fear of prison and death was really what is threatening our relationship, but that's not it. He said, before the rooster crows, I'm going to show you what your problem is, Peter. I'm going to show you what, like, like many of us, we think we've overcome the enemy, but we really don't understand what the enemy is. The devil exploits what's already in you. Come on, somebody. I said, the devil exploits what's already in you. And Peter, that Peter had a weakness, and his weakness was a need to belong, a need to fit in. Peter's weakness was a need to belong and a need to fit in. And, and Peter, Peter needed everyone to like him. He needed everyone's approval. And I'm going to show you that in just a minute where the Apostle Paul rebukes him over it. Peter was afraid of rejection. He was afraid to stand alone. Peter was afraid to be rejected. He was afraid to stand alone. And this is why Jesus is rebuking him. And later on, Paul would rebuke him for the same thing. I'm going to read it to you in the book of Galatians chapter 2, my favorite book in the whole Bible. Galatians chapter 2 and verse 11. It's all right if we teach some word tonight. Amen? Amen. Galatians chapter 2 and verse 11. I, I know sometimes we kind of fluffy on Sunday morning, but this is conference. We, we, we can get deep tonight. Amen? Galatians chapter 2 and verse 11 says, now, when Peter had come to Antioch, this is the Apostle Paul speaking, I withstood him to his face. How many know this is talking about apostles here, uh, apostles. They're, they're getting in each other's face. Apostle Paul said, I got in Peter's face because he was to be blamed. For before certain men came in from James, he would eat with the Gentiles. But when they came, he withdrew himself and separated himself, fearing those who were of the circumcision. And the rest of the Jews also played hypocrite with him, so that even Barnabas, one of my best guys, was carried away with their hypocrisy. So the apostle Paul said, I got in Peter's face because he said, you didn't mind eating with the Gentiles when, when, when there was no, no one around from the old church. But when the old church people came in, you got up and changed your place at the table because you didn't want to be seen with those new Christians anymore. And he said, you did it so well that you pulled other people out. You pulled other people out that were doing good in the church. You messed up other people. And so the apostle Paul said, I had to rebuke him because Peter was afraid of rejection. That's why he cussed at the campfire because he wanted to fit in. That's why he denied he knew Jesus. That's why he said, I don't really go to that church. My sister does. You know, that's, that's why he began to say those things that didn't really match his life. You see, when, when the, the devil can't kill you. Let me tell you, the devil can't kill you. If he could have killed anybody, he would have killed Adam. But he can't, he can't kill you. All he can do is make you separate yourself from God and you'll feel so low that you want to destroy yourself. The devil wants you to destroy yourself yourself because he can't destroy you. Amen. So all the devil can do is trick you into separating yourself from God. Just get you alone. Listen to this really, really closely. He exploited Adam's greed in the garden. The greed was already there. God said, I give you every tree in this garden except for that one. Guess which one Adam wants? I want that one too. I got every tree in this garden, but I want that one too. God said, that's my, that's my tree. Just leave that tree alone. Adam said, I want that one too. Oh, greed. And the devil exploited it. Exploited it. He said, he said, he said he's got some greed in him. This, this man's got all this stuff in this garden. He's got a little bit of greed in him. And the devil says, all I got to do is press that button, and he'll separate himself from God. Are you with me tonight? Are you seeing this? J Judas had some greed inside of him. When, when Mary was washing his feet, and Judas was saying, man, that's, that's a bunch of, that's a couple of thousand bucks right there. She's pouring on the floor. And, and he interrupted her, interrupted this woman's worship, said, hey, 
Hey, couldn't we sell that and give that to the poor? But not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. He, he, was, he had some greed, and all the devil had to do is just, I know where your button is. I'll just press that button. I'll just press that button. I, to get you to sell out Christ, all I got to do is offer you 30 pieces of silver, and, man, you, you'll give him up because you've got a greed problem, and you've allowed it to remain until I could exploit it. You know, Peter had an insecurity problem, and the devil knew all I got to do is press that button. He's not secure. He needs to fit in. He needs everybody's approval. I know how to mess with him. So I'll just do it. Moses had a temper problem. All I got to do is get under his skin a little. he smash these tablets into bits uh, right in front of everybody because he's got a temper problem. He got mad. I, I get, get him to kill one Egyptian and hide him in the sand, put him under the bondage of guilt, take him hostage with that guilt and begin to control his life. He's got a temper problem. I know where his button is and I know what to do. David's got a pride. Uh, he's got a pride problem. He's got to be important. He's got to be king. He's used to people cheering his name. He, he, he's got to be able to say, I can get any girl I want, and nobody can do nothing. He's got a pride problem, and I know where his button is. Uh, Solomon had a lust problem, and the devil knew it. Jacob had a dishonesty problem, and the devil knew it. Come on, somebody. You know your Bible. You know your Bible. He couldn't throw Jesus off the mountain, so you know what he tries to do? tries to get him to throw himself off the mountain. Remember Jesus when they walked him to the edge of the cliff? Walked him to the edge of the cliff and Jesus looked over the edge. Looks over the edge and said, that's not how I die. I'm supposed to die on a cross. He turned around, walked through him, and went back to town. He walked to the edge of the cliff and said, that's not how I die. I die on a cross. Turned around, walked to the edge of town. So the devil couldn't push him off the cliff, so the devil tries to entice him into throwing himself off the cliff. Are you with me? Are you with me? So, so, so the, the thing is, don't fall for ordinary bondage. Don't allow yourself to be delivered from the obvious only to be enslaved by the acceptable. Allowing things in your life that God doesn't want in your life. The devil's goal was never to keep you in Egypt. The devil's goal was to keep you out of the promises. The devil's goal was not to keep you in Egypt. I don't care if you die in Egypt or die in the wilderness. Just don't go into the promises of God. Because if you ever get in the promises of God, you'll begin to lead other people out to the promises of God. So listen, listen, you can, uh, you can, you can clean up on the outside all you want, and I won't bother you. The devil won't bother you. It's fine. Leave Egypt all you want. Just don't go into the promises of God. Because when you go into the promises of God, you begin to set other people free. You begin to lead other people out. He doesn't care if you're in bondage in Egypt or bondage in the wilderness. All the devil cares about is that you're not living in the promises of God. Because when you enter the land of promises, you start to bring other people out. When you live in the promised land, you will attract neighbors. Look how he's leaving. Look how he's living. Look at the joy this guy's got. Look at the victory this guy's got. Look, look, at, look at all they're able to build. Look at all they're able to do. Other people begin, I want to live where he lives. Where does he live? He lives in the promised land. He lives in the promised land. How do you get there? You got to go there through God. You got to follow the voice of God. You got to follow it all the way there. He lives there. When you begin to live, when you set up homestead in the promises of God, you will attract other neighbors that want to live in the promise of God, and then you'll be going, you know, all Moses had to do was make it out of Egypt into the presence of God. You read the story very closely of Moses. He left Egypt. He went through the wilderness. He came to Mount Sinai. He spoke to a burning bush. The burning bush said, I want you to, you've made it here. I want you to go get your people, and I want you to bring them where? Here. I want you to bring them back to Mount Sinai. Well, you see, I thought Moses was supposed to take them into the promised land. Moses can't take him in the promised land. You know why? He's never been there. He's never been there. When they got to the promised land, he sent in Joshua, Caleb, and 10 other people. And Joshua had been there, and that qualified him to take them there. But Moses had only been to that spot, and that's as far as he could go. So I can't take you any further than I have never been. Come on, somebody. I can't take you any further than I've never been. I've never been there, so I can't take you. I've been here, so I can bring you here, but I can't take you there. Who's been there? Joshua said, I've been there. What's it like? Don't matter what it's like. If God says go, we're going. Amen. If God says go, we're going. 
Uh, the, so ten people stood up and said, man, they're, they're like giants over there. They're, they're, they said more accurately, they're, they're, they're cannibal, cannibal, human-eating giants over there. And, 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 and they said, why are they so big? And Joshua said, they've been eating these grapes. And he held up a grape the size of a basketball. He says, the land flows with milk and honey. Just like God said, we ought to go take it right now. That's what Joshua said. He had been there, and he was eager to take somebody else there. Amen? But they wouldn't follow him that day. You can't take people where you've never been. The enemy is trying to destroy you. He, he just wants to separate you from God. And the only way he can destroy you is separate you from God, and you'll destroy yourself. And so, so he has this little trick to settle you in ordinary, to settle you in good enough, to settle you. Well, you quit all the bad stuff that everybody sees. Just settle down right there. You'll be okay. It's, it's not enough. It's not enough for you to beat addiction and still be depressed. Come on, somebody. It's not enough. It's not enough that you quit all the vices, but you still live in anger and you still live in bitterness. No, God doesn't want you just out of bondage. God wants you in the promise of of God, free and right and happy and overjoyed with God's blessing. Clap your hands if you want to live in the promise of God. <clears throat> Hallelujah. Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 10. Ephesians 6 and verse 10. Right here. Just baptized myself. That's all right. Oh, Jesus. Father, Son, Holy Ghost, I got it both covered. Amen. Ephesians 6 and 10 says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord. How many love the Word of God? I could just read this and be happy. Be strong in the Lord and the power of His might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand the wiles of the devil. Tricky devil. Everybody say tricky devil. Yeah, be able to stand the wiles of the devil. And I want you to do that because I want you to know you're not wrestling against flesh and blood. You're wrestling against principalities and powers and against rulers of darkness of this world and against spiritual weakness in high places. And because of that, you need to take on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand in that evil day. And having done all, stand. Stand there, having your loins girt about with truth, having on the breastplate of righteousness, your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, take the shield of faith wherein you'll be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Let me let you in on something. Truth, righteousness, peace, faith, salvation, the Word. That's what he just named. Truth, righteousness, peace, faith, salvation, and the Word. These are the things that fight off the devil. Can I get an amen? Let me say it again. Truth, righteousness, peace, faith, salvation, and the Word. These are the things that fight off the devil. Everybody say amen. And this is why so much of the church is in bondage because we focus on the wrong things. We, we need to stop thinking that we're going to shout the devil away. You're not. We need to stop thinking we're going to sing the devil away. You're, you're not. You're not going to sing away. When, when, when you actually, what, what you need more than anything, we actually, what we need is more truth in our life. Can I get an amen? I, I want, I'll say it like this. If you haven't truth the devil, if you haven't truth the devil away, he's still there. If you have not truth the devil away, no matter how much you sing, no matter how much you shout, no matter how many services you attend, if you have not truth, the devil away in your life, he's still there. And so we, we, we make sure we get all the acceptable things out of our life for the church, but we allow ourselves to remain offensive to God. And God wants us to get a little deeper. I, you've, left, you've left Egypt. I know you're not doing those things. I know you've cleaned all that junk out of your life. I know that. We all know that. But you hadn't gone far enough yet. You got to go all the way over here and get into the promises of God. Because once you get to the promises of God, the devil can't mess with you anymore. Once you get in the promises of God, gossip blowing through the church won't affect you anymore. Come on, somebody. Once you get in the promises of God, you don't care who stops going to church. You're going to keep going. Amen. Once you get in the promises of God, it don't matter if the air condition don't work. You still worship God. Amen. Once you get in the promise of God, they can change the music, anything they want to. You're still worshiping God. Amen. Once you get in the promise of God, somebody can get discouraged and they won't, you, they won't be able to pull you down because you're a promise keeper. You, you, man, I, I, I don't build a house in the promised land. I live here now. I don't live in 
there. I don't live in the struggle anymore. I don't live in the wilderness anymore. And I sure don't live in the bondage. Amen. I don't live in the bondage and I don't live in the struggle. I live in the promise. And by living in the promise, you become secure in God. You become strong in God. Proverbs 6 and 16. I'll just read it real quick. It says six things the Lord hates and the seven are an abomination to him. God hates a proud look. God hates a lying tongue. He hates hands that shed innocent blood. He, he hates a heart that devises wicked plans. Feet that are swift to run to evil. He hates a false witness who speaks lies and anyone who sows discord among the brother. Listen, listen. I'll, I'll break it down real quick. God said, I don't like pride, lying, betraying incident, innocence, treachery, a talebearer, and people that sow discord. Get this out of your life. Get this out. When, when, when you get this out of your life, you will see the promises become to, come to pass because now you're getting spiritual. You get spiritual. Don't call me. Don't call me when you stop cussing. Call me when you stop gossiping. Amen. Don't call me when you when you stop only learning the words to the latest song. Call me. Call me when you get to the place that you can worship him with no music at all. That listen, you don't need a production. You just need to lift your hand to God. You can connect to him anytime. Then you're getting spiritual. Amen. And when you get to that level, when you get to that level, you become strong and untouchable. Listen, the Bible says that, that God drove Jesus into the wilderness for 40 days, had nothing to eat. Now, I'd struggle with that. Come on, somebody. Come on. That's all right. I'm all right with it. I'd struggle with that. <clears throat> but, you know, the truth is Jesus had come to the point that you couldn't even mess with his flesh and get him off course. But I tell you that he still felt his flesh because in the garden he admitted that he was feeling his flesh. When he said, you know, when he come to the jumping off place Thursday night before, you know, he's, he's right, before, right before the resurrection time, no matter what time it is on your calendar, he gets there to that place. He gets, and I love that teaching that you were mentioning about the 13 months and because it's interesting stuff, how we, we begin to worship the holiday. And I'm not worshiping the holiday. I want to worship the, the event. I want to recognize the event. Amen? I'll take the resurrection on any day. Come on, somebody say amen. We, we, we can have Easter Monday if y'all want to. I'm good with it. We, we just, I just, I just, I'm happy about the event. But Jesus got to that garden. He got to the jumping off place. And he said, Father, if there's another way to do this, while I'm down here on this earth and I've got used to this flesh and I know what it's like to be tired and hungry and hurt and I know what it's like to pull these whiskers, if there's another way to do this, let this bitter cup pass from me. That was his flesh talking to him. But then his spirit set up, said, no, 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 no. You know what we came to do. And J Jesus said, he said, let this bitter cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, not, my, not what my flesh wants to do, but what my spirit came to do. Not my will, but thy will be done. Amen. Jesus said, I got to take them all the way to the promises. I can't leave them in the struggle. I can't just get them out of bondage and say that's close enough. I've got to get you to the promises so you can know the full blessing of God. Stand with me, please, all over this building. Hallelujah. <clears throat> Jesus said, I got to clean your feet. I got to clean your feet. Well, you never clean my feet. Huh? Oh, I'm, I'm religious. You never clean. Jesus said, if I don't clean your feet, you're not, you're not going to get all the way in. He said, I can't leave you halfway. Can't leave you away. I, I want you to go a couple of steps further this week. We're, we're, we're going to do this all week. I want you to go a couple of steps further. I know, I know you come out of Egypt. I'm so proud that you came out of Egypt. I'm so happy that you got free from those things that were so destructive in your life. How, how many have known somebody? You know, we, we work with a lot of prison ministry at our church, and we haven't since the hurricane because one of the things we did is we always fed these guys. There's, there's two work release centers in the state of Florida where if you're in your last six months of, of prison, not jail, prison, and you've, and you've not committed a violent offense, there's a nonviolent offense, and you're in your last six months, your last six months of prison, you can voluntarily go to a work release center. And there's two things they'll let you do at that center. That's go to work and go to church, if a church will come get you. And for 20 years, we went and got two van loads of guys from the work release center and brought them to our service. And the first, when we first started doing it, we noticed 
that guys would come a time or two and they wouldn't come back. And they said they loved the service. So I asked one of them, I said, well, why didn't so-and-so come back? He said he loved it. He said, well, your church lets out too late for lunch. And when we get there, if you're not in line at that specific time, you don't get lunch. So if they go to your church, they don't get to eat till supper time. And I said, well, I know how to fix that. And we started feeding them, remember, D Dane and Pauline? We, we started feeding them. So then we'd bring them to church and we'd feed them. And then everybody wanted to come to our church. Because they said, man, these church folks can feed. I'm talking about chicken and dumplings. I'm talking about macaroni and cheese. We go into this. Then everybody trying to get on the harvest van to go to our van, pull up, and they're fighting for a seat. They want to go to the, our church because we would church them, then we would feed them, then we would take them back. Because I said, that ain't right, that, that, that they're punished if they go to church. And, and, you know, I thought to myself as we were, we were going through all this, that, you know, they, they want to they wanna get free. They want to get free, and I know how to get them free. I know how to get them to Jesus. I know how to, them to get free. But, but what it came down to is you had to, you had to make that commitment to get all the way out because there's a difference between freedom and liberty. <clears throat> if, if I'm incarcerated in prison and I break out, I'm free, but I am not at liberty. Now, I'm, I'm free. I got out. I slipped by the guard. I'm out. I'm free. But I can't go, you know, open a bank account and buy a house and, and set up. And, and man, they're, they're coming to get me every moment. I'm not at liberty, you know. And this is what I'm talking about. Some of you got out of Egypt, but you're not at liberty yet because you've got to get to that place where you're not worried about it anymore. You're not worried about it anymore. You're not struggling with it anymore. You're not fixing to go back, fixing to turn loose, fixing to stop coming to church, fixing to. Yeah, that's, that's not a concern anymore, man. You're way past that. You've moved into the land of promises. You've lost your worry. You're not, remember what I said this morning? You're anxious for nothing. You've lost your worry. Your fear has lifted off of you. You don't have any more bondages in your life. You're beginning to know the freedom of God, and it's changed you. As I pray tonight, I, I want to pray with you, and I just want, I, I want to pray with you uh, a little, little more personal tonight. And right where you're sitting, I'm going I'm to ask you to just own something tonight. Own something. I'm not talking about what everybody sees. I'm talking about what only you and God know about. And I'm not asking you to tell everybody because only you and God need to talk about it. How many know Jesus is our high priest? You don't have to confess nothing to me, but I, I need you to talk to God. Come on, somebody. Let me say it again. You don't have to confess anything to me, but I want you to talk to God. But I want you to get real with him because I, I believe that you can't get right until you get real. Come on, somebody. You can't get right until you get real. As long as you're just uh, doing a show for everybody else, that's all your focus is going to be. Did they see me? Well, the Bible says we all stand before God naked. You, you, you ever done the screening thing in the airport? You put your hands up, and, you go, and they, they see all your goodies. I mean, I mean, you just not. Hey, you know, they, if, if you got anything in your pocket, they know it. That's how God sees you. God sees you like the people at the airport. Come on, somebody. God already saw that. So you got to remember that when you kept it a secret, you just kept it a secret from us. You didn't keep it a secret from God. And, and you see, the problem is, and I say this, and I don't want to mess anybody up. I'm not getting any deep doctrine or whatever. You know, God's not judging your behavior. We judge one another's behavior because we can see it. So we judge one another's behavior, and that's how we get in trouble, judging one another's behavior because God doesn't want us to judge. God is judging the cause of your behavior. God's judging your heart. And, and Jesus said it like this. If you look on a woman with lust, you've committed adultery already. I didn't touch her. God says, but it's in your heart. And in the wrong situation, you would touch her. In the wrong situation, you're in trouble. And God said, I'd like to get that out of your heart before you wind up getting in trouble. Come on, somebody. You know, the Bible says, if you hate your brother, you're the same as a murderer. I didn't even touch him. But, but in the wrong situation, you'd kill him dead. Come on, somebody. And God said, I'd like to get that out of your heart before you wind up in the wrong situation. Come on, somebody. I want to get that. Well, I hadn't even done it yet. But God said, the potential to do it's there because you've never allowed me to remove that. And all you got to do is wind up in the wrong situation and you'd be just like them guys in prison. You'd be just like the, them people with all that destruction in their life. Just the wrong situation. 
And you know what God says? If I know it's there, guess who else knows it's there? All he's got to do is touch that button. This guy's got a temper problem. Watch this. He may go off here. And this guy's got a temper problem. Watch this. This, this guy's real insecure. Watch this. So God wants to help you with those things. How many believe God can help you with those things? Come on, somebody. Everybody just bow your head just a moment. I'm not going to make you come down for this. This is a, you know, I, I don't know if you know this, but the Holy of Holies is a one-man room. Just you and God in there. Amen. I want you to just bow your head just a minute. I don't need you to tell me what it is. God knows what it is. I just need you to say, Pastor, there's something there. I want God to help me with it. Just raise up your hand just a minute. I'm not going to make you come down. I'm not going to ask you to come down. I'm going to pray with you right where you stand. There's something there I want God to help me with. All over this room, men, women, all over this room, they're being honest with God, and I appreciate that. They're being honest. They're being real with God. I appreciate that. I appreciate the honesty. Okay, you can put your hand down now. Let me just tell you, I want you to go ahead and assume that the people on both sides of you, they raise their hand. They raise their hand. They're struggling with something. You don't know it, but they know it. They and God know they're struggling with something. I want you to, I want you to pray for your brother and your sister tonight. I want you to ask God to help them out. I want them to come live where you live, in the land of promises. I don't want them to stay in the wilderness, in the area of struggle. I don't want, I'm glad they're out of bondage, but I don't want them to live in struggle. I want them to live in promises. Come on, would you join hands? Just reach over and join hands with the people next to you. I want you to pray for your brothers. The Bible said for us to pray for one for another. I want you to pray with your brothers and sisters right now. Heavenly Father, I pray for my brother and my sister on my left and on my right. I don't know what their struggle is, but God, they stand before you and you know exactly where they're struggling. God, I love them enough to give this prayer for them. And God, I ask you to strengthen them. Number one, I want them to know that I love them and I care about what they're struggling with and I care about what they're fighting. And I don't want to lose them in this church. I don't want to lose them in the family of God. So I want them to make it to the promised land. I'm pulling for them. I lift them up right now. God, whatever their struggle is, we claim the blood of Jesus right now. And the blood of Jesus washes away our sin. Everything that's unlike you is washed away by the blood of Jesus. Right now, God, we ask you to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And the Bible says all of us that call upon the Lord, we are saved. Our transgression is washed away. Our wrong is removed and is cast away. And Father, we believe right now total forgiveness belongs to the believer. Father, I pray for my brother. I pray for my sister. I, I lift them up. I ask you to strengthen them. If I can ever help them, I want you to give me that opportunity to help them. I want to be the encourager of the brethren. Let me never be guilty of discord. Let me never be guilty of gossip. Let me never be guilty of a critical spirit. Let me never be guilty of judging. Let me be the lifter of the brethren. Let me be the encourager of the body. Lord, I pray every one of these people have taken their need before you, God, and you have ministered to this need today. And God, if my neighbor didn't live there at the beginning of this service, at the end of the service, my neighbor is moving into the promised land, and they're going to live with me there in the promises of God. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Come on, give the Lord praise, everybody. Come on. Amen, boys. Needed to hear it. Be seated for a brief minute. Then gone back to prepare. But we got a few more things we want to do. Uh, first off, Sister Lori, would you come up here? This morning I prayed with a lady that came to our second service who has leukemia. Uh, on the way out the door, boy, I, was, I just felt that. Pray for her. And then tonight I felt the Lord say, you, you need to pray for your wife. You know, we've made it through since October uh, through a, a series of chemotherapy and radiation. I do believe in miracles. I wouldn't brought Pat back up to you if I didn't believe in a miracle. And Sister Lori has one more uh, trail we got to deal with. And uh, yeah, I had you. Well, let's be Catholic. Stand up. <laughs> Amen. 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 Uh, those that like to pray with, with 
Lori, come up here. You know, we, we, we took some time away from church because she did, because we did, there's a, uh, when you go through chemotherapy, you're, you're what's the word, baby, uh, compromised, amen. So we, did, we didn't want that to, we wanted her to build her strength. Now she's built back up. I mean, she's gotten stronger. But now that she's got this way, we got a radiation issue we got to deal with. And it's, in a, uh, it's a sensitive area. It's in the brain. So uh, we believe in for a total, absolute, 100% shouting time, ringing the bell, amen, dancing, believing God for you. And listen, let me just say this to you. Those of you that are going through something like this, would you celebrate her victory till your victory gets here? Amen. Now we got to celebrate one another till it gets here. Come on. Eight years, Keith. Amen. Amen. Eight years. Father, in the name of Jesus. I live my sister, my wife, my help me to you. I pray for healing from head to toe. Lord, I rebuke fear right now in the name of Jesus and trepidation, anxiety over what we've got left. We've made it this far, Lord, by faith, and we're going to keep going. I thank you for touching my wife. I thank you for bringing her back and, and her mind being sharp. And, and God, to, to get back the understanding she is your child. The Lord never promised in that book that it pertains to hers and hers. So we stand on it. We believe you for healing. We thank you for mercy. We thank you for your goodness. We thank you this church stands behind her. And God, I thank you, Lord, that, that you have surrounded her with great friends. Amen. In the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Man, if I could get the uh, servant leaders ready here, you need to tie the offering envelope tonight. Uh, I want you to give over and above. Amen. When I say that, I mean that. Man, I would love to see a, a literal couple thousand dollars from this little group here tonight. Amen. To be able to bless our. There was a good word tonight. It was strong. Let me say for men, I always say I don't understand women. Uh, yeah, I've been. Yeah, man. I'm like Keith. I just don't understand them as well as I'd like to. But here's the bottom line. Men have a fear of being exposed. So when you hear this kind of preaching tonight, there's a fear of being exposed. Because we understand our strengths, but we also know our weaknesses. I'm kind of like Peter. I, I want to say, Lord, uh, I'll die with you. Matter of fact, I can't tell you how many times I've prayed to die over the last 40 years. Lord, you go ahead and take me. I'm jumping out of this plane. You can take me. I'm coming off this bungee cord. You can take me. I'm sliding around this curve. You can take me. The issue is not death to me. It's never been a fear of death. Never been a fear of death. It's living in the fear of wondering, God, am I going to make it to the end and get my crown? Am I going to be able to finish this race? Am I going to be able to be with the men that you put in my life and be the guy that's going to make it? That's, that's my, my concern. And, and at times, I, I don't have a lot of fear, but there's that, that fear of exposure, that fear of wondering, can, can I make it? Okay, I got up again. I started again. I pressed in again. I, I got on off, you know, off the wagon, back on the wagon. God, help me one more time. Amen. To finish my race. And I think that's what Paul said when he said, I, I fought a good fight. Finish my race. I think it's Stephen Hart all the time. Once you know that, Sister Hart, I think of him. He finished his race. I'll be honest, I envy him at times. I hurt for you guys. I hurt for the girls. I do. You know, I look over and I see a scholar, Joseph, both their mothers passed over the last just months. They finished their race, but we got to finish ours. We got to keep pressing. And if God chooses to leave us here, then we stay here and we press on. Amen. Did everybody get envelopes right in front of you? Y'all ready to give? Amen. Now, when we give, my, is, what are the instructions? Do we go through the door down the hall or we go outside and into the door? There you go. Go ahead, guys. Start passing the bucket and I'll pray as you pass it. Father, we thank you that your hand's upon us tonight. The Word of God had a 
touched our spirits, reached into us, and pulled us a little closer to the promises to stand and keep believing. Lord, I'm looking to see you build this as a healthy church. Lord, I've been a part of building big buildings before. To be able to just have a healthy church. Lord, it's a fun bunch to hang out with. I love this house. I love the people you put here. We are intricately a part of building this cathedral. We thank you, Lord, for the finances. And we will adjust ourselves during this economic downturn. But we're going to see, we're going to see provision for your folk. You always have provided for your people. We don't live under the economy of the United States of the world. We're kingdom people. So I thank you, Lord, for every blessing that's here. Remind us, Lord, we've made it through lean times. We'll make it again in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You can stand with me, Mike. We're going down the hall. We want you to go down the hall. You say, well, I really don't want to get in.